What are the conditions to answered prayers? The word of God says, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Psalm 91.15 Welcome to a Grace Digital presentation. In this video, we will cover the seven conditions for answered prayers. Number one, come with reverent submission. The word of God gives us an in-depth insight into how Jesus prayed. We were not there to see it, but thank God for the Bible. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Hebrews 5, 7. We are told why God always hears the prayers of his son. It says that Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission. This type of submission is the first condition in approaching God when we want our prayers answered. Submission has four primary ingredients, humility, obedience, respect, and love. Pride blocks so many Christians from submitting, but pride is destructive. It must not be harbored. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, In the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Also, Obedience and respect are principal requirements in submission. Because a God you cannot obey and respect, you cannot claim to be submissive to. Finally, on that note, remember God desires your love. Learn to shower Him with your love. That way you will make your relationship stronger. How do we show this reverent submission? Hebrews 5.7 refers to the time when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and this is the description of what took place at that time. And he went a little beyond them, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. Reverent submission, therefore, consists of saying to the Father, Not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. It consists of renouncing our own will and accepting the will of God. Jesus gave us a prayer to use a pattern. It is, of course, what we call the Lord's Prayer. In part of this prayer, he included this very principle. He taught us to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you come to God, you need to say, your will be done. Those simple words mean your saying, if my will is not aligned with yours, then I set aside my will or abandon my will so that yours will be done. You are basically saying, when our two wills conflict, let yours have free course. Prayer is one of the greatest opportunities, one of the greatest privileges, and one of the greatest ministries available to all Christians. I do not read that Jesus ever actually taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray. Number two, have faith. The book of Hebrews lets us know the second requirement for approaching God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews 11:6 NIV. Faith is a basic condition for being accepted in the presence of God. Any individual that approaches God is asked to believe. We are required to believe two particular things. First, we must believe that God exists. Second, we must believe that He rewards those that earnestly seek Him. Most people don't have any trouble believing that God exists. However, this is not sufficient to meet the condition of faith. We must believe that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Do you believe that? You may say, Well, I try, but perhaps I am not seeking Him too well. I don't know much about theology. I have good news for you. Faith of this kind is not primarily concerned with doctrine or theology. Rather, it is about relationship. It involves trust in God as a person. It is confidence in His character, His reliability. In fact, get away from the thought of theology when you approach God in faith. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted him righteous because of his faith. Genesis 15, 6 Faith is so great that the faith of Abraham was considered as his righteousness. 
The word also lets us know, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the whole universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Number 3. Approach God boldly. Another condition in approaching God in prayer is coming before God boldly. Come with confidence. You need to approach God confidently. Two scriptures from the book of Hebrews tell us why we should approach God with confidence. The first verse tells us, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16 We are praying to someone who is on a throne. A throne indicates a king. This is not merely a king, but the king. The king of all kings, the lord of all lords. The supreme ruler of the universe, the one who said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Then it is a throne of grace. Grace is one of the key words in the New Testament. It always stands for something that goes beyond anything we can earn or achieve by our own efforts. Because it is a throne of grace, we are not limited to what we deserve or to what we can achieve or what our own efforts can accomplish for us. Another beautiful scripture from Hebrews that encourages us to come with confidence. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, 19 and 22. Come without condemnation. The positive side of coming to God boldly is to come with confidence. The other side is that we come without condemnation. Several passages of scripture speak about the need to be free from condemnation. Here is one from the Psalms. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalm 66, 18, NASB. To regard iniquity in my heart means that I am conscious of something that condemns me. Every time I try to approach God with faith, Satan reminds me of this flaw that is not right, that has not been dealt with. It might be a sin that has not been confessed, or, if it has been confessed, I have not claimed and received God's forgiveness. If I am conscious of this flaw in my heart, I will not receive that which I pray for. I must remove the consciousness of sin from within my heart and come boldly before his throne. See Hebrews 4.16 Number 4. Have the right motive. The fourth condition of coming into the presence of God is having the right motive. Religious people tend to focus on externals. They are concerned about the way people dress and the things they eat. It is hard for religious people who work from the outside in to realize that God starts with what is inside and works outward. The truth is, God looks at the hearts of men. We'll see in the Bible that when God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons to be the future king of Israel, all of them were externally strong, handsome, and upstanding. Every time Samuel saw one of these externally beautiful sons, he told himself, this must be the one. But every time Samuel would say that, the Lord corrected him and said that's not the one. Then the Lord explained the situation to him. God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 God searches the thoughts and intents of our hearts. God looks at our motives. God does not only look at what we ask for when we pray, but he's also concerned as to why we want it. The following verse explains it. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. James 4, 2-3 A simple reason we do not have the things God wants for us is because we do not ask. But if we do ask and do not receive, it might be because you are praying with the wrong motives. In particular, James warns us of a wrong motive in praying to our Father, and that is that we spend it on our personal pleasures. If our prayers are self-centered, our motives are wrong. We are simply aiming to get something for our own comfort and personal satisfaction. So we ask, what is the right motive for praying? Jesus stated it clearly. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 13, 
Jesus gave us a wonderful promise that whatever we ask in his name he will do. However, the basis on which he will do it is this, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The right motive for praying is that the answer may bring glory to God. This is actually the motive for all we do. Number 5. Forgive those who have hurt you. In the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things Jesus taught us to say was, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Matthew 6, 12 Forgive us as we forgive others. What we might fail to realize is that there is a condition for receiving answers to prayers. The last petition in the Lord's Prayer is a petition for deliverance from Satan. Deliver us from the evil one. Matthew 6:13. You and I have no right to pray for deliverance till we have forgiven others as we would have God forgive us. Jesus also tells us, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Mark 11:25. Now that does not leave out anything or anyone. When you pray, forgive, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Mark 11:26. This is absolutely clear, and it is spoken to Christians, those who have God as their Heavenly Father. Before you and I pray, we must forgive. It will do us no good to try to approach God in prayer with unforgiveness in our hearts against anyone or anything. Number 6. Be directed by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God tells us, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. How do you live daily as a son or daughter of God in this world? It is by being regularly and continually led by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul applied this truth about the leading of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. This is especially true for our prayer lives. In this way, the Spirit also helps us in our infirmities, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Number 7. Ask according to God's word. The seventh condition of getting our prayers answered is praying in accordance with the Bible. This point is very closely related to the previous condition, being directed by the Holy Spirit. You see, the great issue in prayer is the will of God. If I am praying according to the will of God, then as we have seen in Scripture, I know that God hears me. And if I know that God hears me, I know that I have the petition that I ask. The next thing you might say to yourself is, How do I know the will of God? And where is the will of God revealed? The answer is in the Word of God. The Word of God is packed from start to finish with divine promises. The Apostle Peter calls these promises exceedingly great and precious promises, 2 Peter 1.4. And do you know what those promises are? The promises of God are the will of God. Thus, when you find a promise that relates to your situation and meets your need, that promise is God's will for you. God never promised anything that was not His will. Anything else would be inconsistent. Suppose you came to him and said, Lord, you promised. He would never say, Yes, I promised, but I don't want to do it. This last condition, then, is the great secret that clinches our life of prayer. We pray according to God's will as revealed in his word. You will never pray a higher or more effective prayer. Then when guided by the Holy Spirit, you go to the word, find the promise that relates to you and your situation, and say, Lord, you said it, so you will do it. If you do this, having met the previous conditions for prayer, you will discover the secret of effective praying. We are creating the in-depth series on understanding prayers. If there is any question you have regarding prayer, put it down in the comments and we will work on a video for you as soon as possible. Thanks and God bless.